Hello, in this video, I'm going to talk about obesity and exercise recommendations for preventing or reversing obesity. Um, so obesity is abnormal or excessive accumulation of fat that may impair health. Um, so there are different ways to assess and measure obesity. Uh, the most common method that's used is the body mass index or BMI. Um, so in, in somebody who does have an excessive amount of fat accumulation, the BMI is fairly accurate. Um, BMI is uh, an expression of the relationship between body mass and height. So essentially a higher BMI means a greater amount of mass relative to the height of the person. Now, there is a serious flaw um, that somebody could have a large amount of body mass, but it could be lean mass rather than fat tissue. Um, so like we could have a bodybuilder who has a large amount of muscle mass and could have 3% body fat and their BMI would tell them that they're obese because they have so much body mass relative to their height. Um, so whether BMI is accurate for a certain individual or not really depends on um, their lean mass and their level of fitness. So somebody who's, who's fit and muscular and their BMI says that they're overweight or obese, um, that tells you that's probably not a good measure for that individual. Someone who is not as fit, maybe they don't have a history of exercise and they don't have as much lean mass, um, and the BMI says that they're obese or overweight, then that might be a good measure to use for them um, because they're probably not um, measuring as obese or overweight because of muscle mass. Um, so body composition is another option. Um, there are many different ways to measure body composition. Some are more or less accurate and some are more or less accessible and affordable for, for most people. Um, so hydrostatic weight, skin folds, bod pod, bioelectrical impedance, um, dual x-ray, absorptiometry, and DEXA. Um, so there, some of those are methods that you would only use in a lab. Um, or at, like at a facility where you invest in this very expensive equipment and then work with patients or clients and, and test them using that equipment. And then others are more available and accessible that people can use on their own at home or that like trainers could use one-on-one -on -one without needing large expensive equipment. Um, so body composition is, is preferred um, especially for people who are more lean. And so their BMI might not be representative of their body composition. Um, and then waist circumference is another option. And that is simply where you're measuring right across the belly, the belly button, right across uh, the umbilicus. So you're measuring the total waist circumference. And if it's greater than 40 inches in men or greater than 35 inches in women, then that would um, be classified as obese. Okay, so causes of obesity. Now, this is not clear. This is not cut and dry. Otherwise, everyone would know exactly how to solve it and we would not have as much obesity as we have. Um, so the classic viewpoint here is that um, if you eat too many calories and don't burn enough calories, you have an imbalance in energy consumption and you gain weight. Um, to some extent, that is true. Um, but that is grossly oversimplified and doesn't apply to everyone. Um, there are people who, even when they're eating at a calorie deficit and they're sure that they're eating at a calorie deficit where they still might not lose weight or they might even still gain weight. So there is more at play here than simply the number of calories in and calories out. So it is a good place to start because for some people it could be the case. They might just simply be eating too much and if they eat less and work out more, they lose weight. So that is sometimes the case. Um, so this idea of the imbalanced energy consumption depends on the idea that all calories are equal. So, you know, carbs, fats, proteins, different types within each of those categories, that all the calories are the same and that different bodies absorb, use and store those calories uh, the same way, again, regardless of the type of macronutrient and that person's genetic predisposition and so on. Um, the other problem with this idea of imbalanced energy consumption 
is that you would theoretically need to know precisely how many calories you are burning each day and how many you are eating each day. That is not possible under normal circumstances to know the precise number accurately. We can estimate using all sorts of methods, different equations and metabolic measures and fitness trackers and all kinds of things. So we have lots of ways to approximate, but we cannot get the precise number. And let's say somebody is just consuming an extra 30 calories a day above what they're burning then in 10 years, they will have gained 32 pounds. Okay, that is so narrow of a margin of error that that would lead us to think that there's more going on than just that because an average person, like we don't know, most of us probably are having a little bit too much or not quite enough because we don't know the precise numbers that we're burning or consuming every single day. And with such a small margin of error, we would all gain weight, even though that is not always the case. Okay, so for some people, it will be as simple as eat less, exercise more, and you lose weight. But as we all know, there are a lot of people who even though they eat less and exercise more, are still not losing weight. Or maybe they do it first, but then they plateau and can't break through that, that plateau because there's something else going on. Um, so for those people, um, there is something going on in their bodies where they are not partitioning fuel correctly. So fuel partitioning refers to how the body decides to use what we're consuming. So how do we use it for energy and where or how do we store it if we have more than what we need? So some people are genetically just more sensitive to carbohydrate consumption. So they might be secreting more insulin than like their average counterpart, like they're secreting more insulin than they should be. And insulin tells fat cells to store more fat. So the more insulin we secrete, the more fat we store. So somebody who is more sensitive to carbohydrate consumption or somebody who is more prone to converting protein into glucose is going to secrete more insulin and that insulin is going to tell their bodies to store more fat. So even if they're eating at a calorie deficit and they're exercising, if the particular nutrients they're consuming are causing excessive um, response of insulin, so excessive secretion of insulin, it will still cause their fat cells to keep and maybe even add more uh, to their fat stores. Um, so for that person, they would have to work with their relative proportions of macronutrients in their diet. It would be more than simply calories in and calories out. It's that plus also paying more attention to the balance between macros. So carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and within each category, what exactly are they having? Okay, so health consequences of obesity. Now, I want to be very clear here. Um, research shows that obesity is correlated with higher risk of these things in these lists. That is different from causing the things on these lists. Okay, so there is increased risk if somebody is obese of diabetes mellitus, hypertension, dyslipidemia, breathlessness, sleep apnea, gallbladder disease, moderately increased risk of the things in the center list and, and slightly increased risk of the things on the right. Now, some of these things could be directly caused by obesity. So like for example, osteoarthritis of the knees, that is physical structural damage in the knees that, that is more likely to occur in somebody who is carrying more weight. It's more likely to cause structural injury in the joints. So that would be caused by. Um, but for a lot of these things, it's more likely that there is the other factor that is causing both the obesity and the condition. So like diabetes mellitus is an excellent example of that. Although obesity is a risk factor for diabetes mellitus, we can't conclusively say that obesity causes diabetes mellitus. It's more likely 
that it is excessive intake of sugar or carbohydrates that is causing both. Okay, so if you watched my previous video about diabetes mellitus, I talked about how that happens in insulin and glucagon. Um, but it makes sense that if we are over secreting insulin and maybe taking insulin, if somebody has diabetes mellitus, that also increases your storage of fat. So when the cells are not answering the door for insulin, the blood sugar stays elevated, blood glucose stays high. And so the liver will convert that high, that excess blood sugar into glycogen and into fatty acids. And those fatty acids are taken up by the fat cells to store for later. So if the cells aren't eating enough glucose, that is even more glucose to be converted and stored as fat. So it makes sense that in that case, it's the dietary patterns that are causing both the obesity and the diabetes mellitus, not that obesity is causing diabetes mellitus. So that would mean that they're correlated, not that one causes the other. Okay, so I wanna be very clear here that on these lists, a lot of these are probably caused by other factors that cause the obesity and the condition. Um, so we still, it's important to understand that obesity does increase the risk of each of these things because whatever is causing the obesity might also be causing the things on these lists. All right, so exercise recommendations for obesity. So really these are exercise recommendations for fat loss. Um, so for cardiovascular exercise, um, the goal should be to burn an extra 2000 plus calories per week through cardiovascular exercise. Uh, it should be weight bearing if possible. Um, if it's not good for the person, like if weight bearing is hurting their knees or it's, it's causing them some kind of harm, then there are other methods, but weight bearing if possible is better. Um, ideally, they will be doing cardio seven days a week. So daily exercise. Now you can fluctuate the duration and intensity um, so that they're not just going all out every single day for months on end. You don't want the person to overtrain, um, but some form of cardiovascular exercise every day is beneficial. Um, so when the person is first starting to exercise, you want to start at about 40 to 59% of their heart rate reserve. So you can calculate that. Um, and then over time, you can build up in intensity and get to 60 to 80% of heart rate reserve. Um, and then in duration also, you would initially start with a beginner with about 20 to 30 minutes a day and build up over time to 60 to 90 minutes a day. And again, you wanna fluctuate in intensity. So even if they're doing 60 to 90 minutes, seven days a week, fluctuate in intensity so that some days are more intense, and then those are followed by days that are, are easier and more restful, even though they're still getting that activity. So it's the difference between like, um, you know, doing sprint training or going for a long distance jog compared to maybe just going for a walk after dinner, that sort of thing. Um, and then strength training, they should certainly strength train. Uh, so apply the usual principles of strength training, apply the usual guidelines as you would for anyone. Um, and in weight loss, the goal is to prevent the loss of lean mass, um, because you don't want to just lose pounds. You don't want to just lose, uh, you know, a certain amount of weight from your body. You want to lose fat. You want to keep the lean muscle tissue and lose the fat. And so strength training will help to maintain your muscle mass and prevent loss of lean mass so that the weight that you're losing is fat and as little muscle as possible. Um, we want to keep that muscle. That's the good stuff. And it's burning calories for us and keeping our metabolism high. So we want to keep that lean mass and just try to lose fat. So if somebody is losing large amounts of fat or large amounts of weight, and they're only doing cardiovascular exercise without strength training, then they're definitely losing lean mass as they do that. Um, we must strength train, we must apply a stimulus to our muscles to cause them to be maintained and, and to keep that lean mass. Um, otherwise, we will break that tissue down just as easily as we break down our fat tissue. 
um, as the person is in a calorie deficit and losing weight. Um, so some more recommendations here. Um, so in somebody who is obese and trying to lose weight, a good goal for a beginner right out of the gate would be to aim for loss of five to 10% of their total body weight. So not just fat, not body fat percentage, but of total body weight in the first three to six months. Um, dietary and exercise habits are fundamental. It, they're absolutely critical for long-term success and weight loss. Um, so they have to change how they're eating. Um, and that could be um, strictly just uh, calories in, calories out. So it could be somebody who, if they just eat less and burn more, they're successful. So um, they will need to stick with that and really um, commit to that change. And for some people, even if they really are eating and working out to a calorie deficit, they still might not be losing weight um, or they still might even be gaining. And that would be somebody who has to pay more attention to their proportions of macros. Um, so somebody might have to consume fewer carbs or uh, be more strategic about when they eat their carbohydrates in relation to the other nutrients. Um, so that's somebody who would really need to pay more attention to those uh, different variables to make sure that they're able to lose weight. Um, you want to progressively increase the total amount of physical activity to over 250 minutes a week, uh, which um, in research has been determined to be the optimal, most beneficial amount of exercise for weight loss. Um, so if somebody goes from being completely sedentary to exercising, they should not jump right in at 250 minutes a week. That is a lot uh, to start with initially if they haven't already been training. So they would start with that initial 20 to 30 minutes a day of cardio and two or three times a week of strength training and build their way up and up and up until they can achieve that level of 250 minutes a week. Um, and then sustained weight loss requires lasting behavioral change. So this is not something where you make these changes, you lose the weight, and then you go back to normal. Because the back to normal is the state where they gained the weight in the first place. So um, the rule of thumb is you want to lose weight doing something you can keep doing forever. Because when you find a way that helps you lose weight and you figure out a strategy that works, um, it needs to be something sustainable that you can sustain once you've achieved your weight and you can continue those behaviors uh, to help you sustain your new state. You might not have to get to a whole 250 minutes a week and maybe you don't have to eat at such a deficit anymore. Maybe you can eat a little bit more, but like, let's say you lose all this weight on a low carb diet you need to be prepared to continue that low carb diet to maintain that weight. Um, so just something to consider, you know, cause when people do all sorts of, of different things to try and lose weight, some things might be effective, some things not, but even if it's effective, if it's not something that you can sustain, then it's not worth doing because you're going to gain the weight back when you stop doing that thing. Um, and so that's where different fad diets and things that just are not sustainable are not good approaches for weight loss. All right. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.